So we have a few more people that I expect will join us and then we'll give it another, uh, well, it's not even 10 o'clock yet. So right. we'll give it a couple minutes and we'll okay. get started. Sounds good. My drive from the Southeastern part of the state was not pretty. No, okay. <laughs> and no one seemed to expect it. Like my daughter goes into school she leaves the house at 5.50 a.m. And her tires were not even, like it hadn't started snowing yet. By no. the time I got to my car at 6.50, it right. was, yeah, there was shoveling to do. Oh, there was, oh God. Well, we were supposed to, we're supposed to get hit, but they said now, not till tonight, because it didn't get cold enough here. Yesterday, we had like a rain ice storm. I think it surprised oh, little Chester because our schools didn't cancel. Right. right. Yeah. Well, they've been hyping it up all week. Mm. Good morning, Donna. Hi. Oh, I was trying to see if I was unmuted. How are you, Gina? Good. How's everybody doing? Everybody. Everybody's good here. I was on vacation the last couple of weeks, so I'm kind of like, ooh, out of it. <laughs> There's my partner in crime, Jess Davigil. Hi, Jess. <laughs> Well, Jeannie, you tell me when you want me yeah. to pull up my screen. Oh. Uh, well, look, so people are still joining. I'm going to do okay. introductions and then I'll turn it over to you, Catherine. Okay. So okay. Um, people are still joining, but we're going to get started because I'm sensitive to everybody's um, schedules. Um, and it's Friday and people want to get their work done and go home and finish their Christmas shopping, right? So welcome everybody, I'm Gina Balkus. I'm the CEO here at the Home Care Hospice and Palliative Care Alliance of New Hampshire. And with me is Leslie Hammond, our education and membership uh, director. Um, I'm really excited to have you join us today to learn more about um, the possibility of relaunching and refreshing the Clear Path Project. So many of you who may have been at your jobs for a long time would remember back between 2013 and 2017, uh, the Alliance had an initiative to train behavioral health, um, uh, to train home health clinicians in behavioral health. And we worked with CNV Senior Care uh, to do that. And we had about 20 agencies participate. We really were the first state in the country that did a project like that. So with Oasis E and the new Oasis E cognitive and uh, behavioral and mood questions. Uh, you'll be expected to assess patients for um, certain conditions and to incorporate treatment into their care plan. And so a lot of agencies have come to us and said, we've, you know, our, we've had a lot of staff turnover. We need, we need more help again. Um, so there were some great parts of what the Clear Path Project did and some some aspects that could have been improved. And so we went back to Catherine and Amy and said, how can you help us again? So today's information session is just that. It's a brief, it's an info session to gauge interest in relaunching the project to see if there are enough agencies to sort of make a group initiative work. Uh, so with us today are Catherine Vanderhorst and Dr. Amy Craven from CMV Senior Care. They are national experts on behavioral health and dementia um, care in the home setting. And uh, we've worked with them for many, many years. Uh, they do a lot of our dementia training that we offer through uh, NewHampshireDementiaTraining.org. And so I'm gonna turn it over to them. Catherine's gonna share her screen. Okay. And I wanna just say upfront that I'm gonna have to leave at 10.30 for uh, an important meeting over at the State House, but Leslie will take over from there. And um, 
feel free to ask any questions along the way. So Catherine, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Gina. And I, some of you, I, I know your names and you're familiar from when we did this before. So um, I'm just gonna go through a, a quick presentation about what are some of the changes and what we're proposing? And again, as Gina said, this is open for discussion. So we welcome people's feedback as well um, at the end. So we'll take questions then. And if you um, you know, have thoughts, jot them down. Because if you're like me, they don't always remember them through a full presentation. But anyways, I'll get started. So this would really, it's called, would be the Clear Path Project uh, 2. And so... Gina kind of mentioned why revisiting behavioral health. And as I'm sure all of you know, because you've been probably through a million Oasis E trainings, the new Oasis E is going to have our clinicians assess cognitive function, um, mood and behavioral assessments that are, are incorporated and also ones for delirium. So it'll be something that now when we identify them, we're going to actually have to address that. The other big issue is that patients who have unaddressed behavioral health issues are really at a greater risk to not follow up and not to manage their medical comorbidities. And I always say to people, if you think about somebody who's extremely depressed, if they're very depressed, they're probably not gonna actively participate in their, you know, their visits and, and be able to manage, say they have congestive heart failure or diabetes it becomes you know, the block that stops that. But then again, that's gonna affect our outcomes. We always wanna improve our patient's quality of life and treat the whole person. The other thing is that data really significantly shows that untreated mental illness leads to higher utilization of emergency room visits and hospitalizations. And the one thing I always like to educate people on is that anxiety and underlying anxiety disorder is has is a correlation to higher emergency room visits than any other type of mental illness. And very rarely, unfortunately, are we addressing that, though we would be addressing that in that training. And really providing behavioral health care would have a positive impact on value-based purchasing. And I think we all know that the need for behavioral health services is huge. Just a quick um, minute on, on CNV. So CNV Senior Care started in 2007. And for those of you who remember in 2015, when we started the training, it was with uh, Dr. Verna Carson and I, uh, Dr. Carson retired a couple of years ago, rightfully so after, I don't know how many years of working. And um, so Amy had came, came into the organization in 2016 and is a, a partner here at CNV. So our real goal is to help agencies meet the unmet need of behavioral health and cognitive disorders. We're both clinicians and that we feel is important. Uh, a lot of the stuff out there today that's taught is not being taught by clinicians who we have experience working in this state. And our programs really meet the requirements for Medicare and state's requirements. And our goal is always to help you improve your outcomes. Um, between the two of us, we have over 60 years of home care experience. As I mentioned, I'm a board certified psychiatric nurse and Amy is a doctor of physical therapy. We're both also certified care managers, and we've done extensive um, research in this area. We've published two national books on Alzheimer's care um, and written and spoken very frequently. And, you know, we have a passion about helping people to provide the service because it's so needed today. And I'm sure most of you are sitting there thinking, yes, it is, especially since COVID. So what are our objectives really of the new Clear Path program? And um, so we're trying to enhance your capabilities and revenue. We want to assist your clinicians to really be able to address the cognitive and behavioral issues that they identify with the Oasis E and have a plan from everything from how to really do the assessment right, to talk to the physician, to be able to manage say the patient who has depression or if they have you know, a cognitive disorder, some type of dementia with a behavioral disturbances. Um, we also are gonna add in this program that each agency that participates, we would be making an individual visit to your agency to really help you assist in the rollout and the planning of having a successful program. We also wanna help all 
agencies improve their overall outcomes to reduce hospitalization and ER use and increase compliance. So why is the Alliance offering this program? Um, as Gina said, there's been interest in it, um, the changes with the Oasis E. If you look at the numbers of what COVID did to mental health in this country, it's staggering. So prior to COVID, on average, one out of every five adults had some mental health disorder. Since COVID, they really predict, especially for anxiety and depression, that it's one out of every three. Um, anybody who lives and is isolated, which as we know most of our home care clients are, it's even more significant. So. I always say to people that the data shows in the first year of our COVID pandemic, our, our prevalence of anxiety and depression increased in by 25%. So it's huge. We want to be able to enhance your agency's offering and improve outcomes and value-based measures, which we'll talk about in a minute. And in New Hampshire, just like every other state, and I'm not singling out New Hampshire, I, I'm in New York and it's huge here, there's really a lack of trained healthcare providers in to provide mental health. And I'll show you some of your statistics in a minute. One of the things I mentioned on that first bullet point was a survey that Leslie sent out a while ago about what were your interests and needs as far as behavioral health. And for those of you who didn't participate, um, I'm, I'm just gonna show you what the survey results came in and what it showed among your, um, your colleagues in the home health world. So of the people that participated in the survey, 80% of the participants said that 20 to 50% of their census has a diagnosis of dementia, very common. 100% of agencies reported that staff were identifying challenges in patients with mental illness who were not identified by doctors, but mental health is issues were present. 100% of the respondents said staff desires to learn new skills to manage patients with particular diagnoses of depression, anxiety, and Alzheimer's and related dementias. Um, so again, those top three diagnoses that agencies identified they wanted more assistance with were dementia with challenging behaviors, anxiety, and then depression. 60% uh, of agencies reported having staff who have experience working in the mental health setting at some point in their career, which actually is a, is a positive because they're people then that can be your leaders. 60% of agencies reported not feeling that they were ready to address the behavioral and cognitive assessments um, mandated in OASIS E. So, and then 100% of recipients said they'd like more education and resources to address behavioral health and cognitive needs. So this was the result of that survey that, that Leslie sent out. So what is, why, why does behavioral health really have an impact with value-based payments? Um, well, we all know that Medicare is moving toward this and that really the OASIS E has these new mandatory assessments that will make it so that we have to address our needs of patients with mental health issues. And in doing so, hopefully provide, you know, really a higher quality of care, better patient outcomes and better experiences. And I just wanna, make a comment about experiences. We worked with an agency a couple of years ago and they tracked their um, satisfaction surveys. And interestingly enough, they found that the patients that they addressed behavioral health in had very positive patient satisfaction surveys. So that was just, it was a big agency in Florida that we worked with. So I thought that was an interesting point I wanted to share with you. So if you look at this next slide, what does managing clients' behavioral health needs have to do with this, with value-based purchasing? Well, if we can identify depression, anxiety, and cognitive changes, again, the most common diagnoses you see in the Medicare population, using evidence-based tools and normalizing in our conversation with our, the individual patients about how to get them to talk about depression and anxiety. And we often talk about that normalizing is, you know, a lot of our elderly clients won't say they're depressed, but they say they're down or blue. How do we really get them to talk about it? If we can provide education and interventions, improve the patient's self-care management, 
We'd also be improving, hopefully, their use of their oral meds, their self-care, and their mobility. What does mobility have to do with behavioral health? Well, again, if somebody's very depressed or they're anxious, they may not be moving around like they, I mean, I, Amy and I recently interacted with a woman who has severe depression and she can, she's in her late seventies. She can walk just fine, but she barely moves because she's so depressed. She barely gets out of a chair. We want to also help give the individual clients strategies to manage depression and anxiety and cognitive disorders in turn really, and, and give that to your staff, which will overall improve their functional status. If we can improve their function, it's gonna increase their ability to deal with comorbidities and hopefully decrease hospitalizations and emergency rooms and increase overall quality of care. And that will have a positive impact on the value-based purchasing um, outcomes that your agency has individually. I made a comment earlier in this presentation that New Hampshire has a shortage of mental health professionals. And again, every state does, so I'm not, it's, but recently um, in the fall, I don't know if you're aware that 48 of New Hampshire's hospitals, 184 psych beds were closed due to staffing shortages. So you're now down 48 beds, which really most states can't afford to lose beds that provide care to people with met severe mental illness. Right now, there were more than 200 open clinical positions within the state's communi 10 community mental health centers, which is a significant increase since the beginning of the pandemic. And the head of the uh, one of the big um, commentaries on your New Hampshire bulletin said the workforce problem is a mental health problem. And what the article went on to say was that there is so much mental health need in New Hampshire because it's very hard to get somebody into a doctor or to get somebody into a therapist. I wanted to give you some other statistics that are really important that show the importance of this. So if you're an elderly patient, say you have a client, on average, it's gonna take six to 12 months, most places in the country to get a patient into a psychiatrist. So we know that our primary cares are often treating the diagnoses. In our area, it takes someone on average almost six months to get into a therapist. If it's private, if it's in a community setting, it can be a couple of weeks to a couple of months. So when you think about the patients you have in the home setting, you know, first off, they're homebound. So the likelihood they're going to go out and get mental health services is rare. The elderly also don't seek out mental health services, but yet they have a growing need. So it's really, it is a huge issue and the lack of staff. And so having staff that can go in the home and help them address this issue will overall improve you know, the outcomes of the individuals you're working for and overall their, improve their quality of life. So what's gonna be new in this training program that's going to be different from the first time we did this? Well, we are gonna to come to your agency. So agencies that signed up, we would schedule a time, we'd have you know weeks when we would be in New Hampshire and we would come and meet, be meeting with your individual agency. And the focus of those meetings would be to really help you roll out the program effectively. Because when AG, Amy and I work with companies individually, we go into those companies and you know we're helping them with everything from their processes to their marketing, to you know, what type of, how much staff is gonna be needed. So that will be part of this rollout. There's also gonna be an option for your agency if they would like to have the training at your agency as opposed to in a regional venue. The training will focus on three main diagnoses, depression management, anxiety disorders, and dementia with behavioral disturbances. So the dementia with behavioral disturbances will be a huge part. And so we'll be doing everything from training people to how to identify it, to manage it, uh, to develop care plans for this, to develop goals, interventions, everything that someone would need to effectively manage that, as well as you know how are we going to get adequately reimbursed for that. And we're also going to be training agencies on how to market this and develop partnerships in their community. 
So what is going to be included is um, we're going to do that on-site visit to an agency. We'll also be doing a initial training that people can come to. And again, with this new uh, clear path, you will have the option to do it at your own agency if you wanted. But we would also be doing regional trainings where you could send individual clinicians to those trainings, everything from your nurses to your social work staff, therapy. Um, and it would be an eight hour training with six hours of nursing CEUs. Um, and again, the focus is going to be on very much training clinicians from A to Z. How do they identify behavioral health? How do they assess it? How do they manage it? Um, what are all the interventions? And then there would be resources that go along with all of these diagnoses. So we're projecting, but again, this is flexible, that the initial training would be conducted in sometime in early 2023. We'd be working that out with Gina and you know the Alliance. And there, again, as I mentioned, is that option if you want to have it at your own agency. And then six to seven months in, we would again be doing a large regional training so that you can not have to pull all your people out to go to the first training. Uh, we also have discussed that there'd be a live training, but with the option of it being virtual for people who could not get there. The materials that everybody would receive um, would be the uh, Road to Wholeness, the big behavioral health manual. It has been updated for Oasis E and it has a lot of new teaching tools in it from when we did this years ago. Um, a depression care guide, an anxiety care guide, as well as an Alzheimer's care guide, which is not something that we um, did in the first initial set of training. And our Alzheimer's care guide is a six chapter care guide that has an enormous amount of teaching for caregivers to use with their patients, but also a lot of family resources that they can utilize with families, as well as care plans for every discipline that would work, that work in the home health setting for all the way down to the, the aid. We would continue to provide ongoing education. So there would be seven ongoing education webinars um, that would be part of the ongoing education that we would be providing. Then there would be, we would offer individual case conferences to your agency. Last time we did this, we just did it that we held um, once a month, what we call clinical champion calls where an agency could call in with, you know, cases that were challenging. We'd be doing this now individually with your agency. So when your agency wanted to do them, and one of the things that we think is vitally important is once we train staff and we get them up and running is for them to be able to present cases and talk about them so that they become more confident. What we find is most of the clinicians are doing the right thing with after they've been through this training, but they need that kind of affirmation. And I know a lot of these cases can be very challenging one of the things I wanna mention with the webinars, we, we would be doing them live, but we would be recording everything. So there would be access for individuals who could not, you know, didn't have the time to access them and could access them at a later date. We would also be providing a three hour sales and marketing training. And that would be for, you know, agencies, for the people in your agencies who go out in the community and market your liaisons to understanding how, what is behavioral health, what services you can provide, and who are the appropriate patients for this program, and what's reimbursable under you know, Medicare services. I just always put this slide up for those of you who haven't seen it, and it looks at really, this was a study published by the CDC, and it was a long-term care study that looked at the incidence of Alzheimer's, depression, and diabetes in the post-acute care settings. And it's pretty significant. Um, if you look at home health for de um, depression, 37.9% of all claims that go through Medicare had some type of depression diagnosis, and 31.4% had some type of, of um, Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis. If you look at it in hospice, it was very high too. In hospice, obviously, dementia has become a, a very, and in some places, a predominant diagnosis, 44.7% of all claims had a dementia diagnosis. 
and 22.9% had a depression diagnosis. So it's huge. One of the things that we point out to people in the training and train to now is that the overlap of depression and anxiety is very common. And the data now shows that in the elderly population, people who have depression, 50% of them also have anxiety and their depression will get treated, but the anxiety won't. And that's why it becomes important because as I mentioned, anxiety leads to higher emergency room visits. We, one of the things that um, we did was look at how many potential Medicare clients are there in New Hampshire who might be eligible for behavioral health care. Now, this was just particularly looked at as it pertained to the diagnosis of depression. So this isn't taking into account anxiety disorders, cognitive disorders, just depression. And we looked at your Medicare eligibles in each county, how many are enrolled in um, managed care, um, what overall is your, your Part A population. And what we looked at is how many people, so there's about 228,886, and this was as of last month, so data through November, people that have traditional Medicare. The average rate of home care utilization we know in the US is on average 10%. But the average rate of home care utilization for people with depression is really closer to 37.9%. And then if you look at the average HERG, and this was data that came out of NAC, uh, their financial conference that was held for the first 30 days, and this was for a behavioral health diagnosis, the reimbursement was 22.55. If and for the second, um, 30 days, it was 1248. So for an average 60 day episode, it was 3507. So you can look at the fact that there's over $19.5 million in revenue out there for people with just if they only are on service with you for the first 30 days, but there's over $30 million in revenue for the state if people are on just the whole 60 day period of time. And one of the things I like to point out is, again, this doesn't count anxiety disorders, doesn't count cognitive disorders. So it's, it's, there is a huge potential to add revenue to your, to your bottom line because there are obviously a lot of patients out there with depression diagnoses. But again, if we did this, so usually when we um, run a performa for the, um, diagnoses under cognitive disorders, because they fall under neuro, they, their reimbursement is even higher. So what are gonna be the projected costs for um, ClearPath at this point? So if we had five or fewer agencies, it would be an estimated $10,250 per agency spread out over a year. And if it was greater than five agencies, it would go down to $9,250. And what would be included in that is that 10 people would be able to attend over the course of the year your, the training. It would include our on-site visits. It would include all the materials, CEUs, certificates of completion, all of the uh, additional webinars. It would include all of the individual case conferencing for your agencies. So what we're really looking for is, you know, somewhere, you know, to cover the costs somewhere in this range to be able to do it. If individuals wanted to send more people to training, um, it's just, you know, say some an agency wants to send 12 people to training it would be an average of $49.50 per person extra to just cover the cost of the materials. So we like to point that out um, in, in this. So that is you know, the, the cost that between our costs and, and the Alliance that we estimated. So again, as we, if we could get more agencies like with the original clear path, costs you know, are, are lower. Just a little, a quick comment on return on investment. Um, and we wanted to just show that. And again, this is reimbursement data based on the next financial conference, but how many patients would you need 
to cover the cost at a gross margin of estimated at 20%. And I know all agencies have different gross margins, some higher, some lower, but on average, you'd need about uh, three and a half behavioral health uh, cases in a three month period of time or 3.1 dementia cases or a combination of it. So basically it's a little over three cases you need in a quarter to cover the cost of, of you know, investing in this, in the doing this program. So Gina, I'm going to, and Leslie, I'm going to open it up to questions. Amy and I are happy to take any questions. Um, again, as I wanted to point out to people, you know, this was a great effort by Leslie and Gina to uh, work with us to try to discern what it is that your agencies really need. And so we, you know, as Amy and I realized, and I'm going to be very honest with you, when we do training with agencies, we always tell them that the ones that are most successful put the training into place as quickly as possible. Um, they don't wait three months. They don't put the people through training and then say, okay, we're going to start, you know, having people address these issues in three months. If they, the sooner that they do it, the likely the greater success. And so our goal in training this time would is really to work with agencies individual. That's why individually, that's why we would come out to them to make sure that we can ensure that success. And we would want to develop, have your agency develop individual, you know, their top five goals of once they've got people trained, what are they going to do to ensure success? And so that's one of the things that would be a big focus of us working with your agency is not only getting your staff trained and up and running and getting, you know, lots of hours of behavioral health content, but also ensuring that you are successful in your efforts to do this. Whether you're a big agency or a small agency, we, we would really want to be there to help you be successful. So Leslie, with that, I'll open it up to anybody's any questions. Um, currently, your lines are muted, but you're welcome to unmute them or um, type in the chat if that's better for you. Clearly, uh, this has a good, solid Alzheimer's care component. So agencies that signed on for this and um, are training with this would not need to do the modules and the quizzes um, that we will be offering through our normal channels. But I think that's a selling point. People hate the quizzes. <laughs> so, hi, it's Donna Frizzell from the VNA of Manchester in Southern New Hampshire. Hi, Catherine. I remember you from the past and thank yes. you for all the work that you do to help us and that you did do. So the question I have is that all the manuals and all the things that I have, I know you said something was new. Is it the same and just that additional new um, or is it a lot different? So we've updated all the materials. They're all, okay. they're updated now on a yearly basis. Generally, we start updating them in the fall of the year. And of course, we have to have everything coincide with the OASIS changes. Mm -hmm. So the materials would be new. The depression care guide and the anxiety care guide have been obviously updated since you know the 2015-2016 time. Mm -hmm. And then um, we have a huge depression care guide. Um, and that would be part of the materials as well in that. And then the webinars that we're doing, um, most of these are newer webinars that we do now as well, but all the materials to answer your question, yes, have been updated. Yeah. Um, and the newest thing your staff would, would be receiving that would be totally new content to them would be all of the, the Alzheimer's resources. So they would, you know, yeah. have access to that. We also give people, um, you know, an assessment packet. So the packet that they receive in their initial training is not just a copy of all of the individual, um, you know, PowerPoints that we're doing, but it's an assessment packet. There's a, we have a huge documentation packet for around dementia care mm -hmm. because we feel that it's so important that people get, if they're providing, you know, service to somebody and dementia is a primary diagnosis, that they document it right so they don't risk get any denial. So we have a huge packet we give out around dementia care documentation, dementia care care plans, but the entire care guide is, as I mentioned, has a care guide for every single discipline, as well as the 
you know, what we're going to do with the client. And it's, it's an enormous amount of resources. Amy and I have these two books that are on our screen there. We've published mm -hmm. one called a resource guide for family and all of the resources that are in that are also in our care guide so that your clinicians can use them with resources. And we, up, Amy updates that every single year. So anything that's new, we, we, we put in there around that's centered around resources and dementia care. So those would be, you know, everything, as I said, that you'd received before has been updated. Um, the care guide for Alzheimer's would obviously be the most, the newest. Um, okay. Thing. Thank you. That and there the are a, a lot of teaching materials in all the care guides, as Catherine said, um, and they, the clinicians find that very useful because they don't make, you can't make a copy of the whole care guide, but you can make copies of the individual teaching tools and use them with families and caregivers mm -hmm. to educate them about different um, things. And, and then in your documentation, you're reflecting that you've educated them and then what they're able to redemonstrate. So then you're, you have, you know, your skill of what you're doing and it gives them more confidence in having those written tools. Right. On how to document. Yeah, and I would say from the last time, um, I do remember that the clinicians really liked those those calls that we were able to have with you, Catherine, um, because they could speak about scenarios, and right. you were able to guide them. And we, you know, we had a social worker, a nurse, a therapist, um, or whoever was involved in the care in the room. So that was definitely very helpful. If I could just we would, be, that. we would be setting those up individually with yeah. you this yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, and I know that last time we were doing it on a Friday morning early, probably, yeah. was, probably wasn't the best time. To right. <laughs> so, you know, we'd be working with individual agencies to accommodate their schedule yeah. uh, when it's best. Or if staff just wants, sometimes somebody might want to just have an individual call. You know, you get a new client. Amy and I had one with an agency the other day, a very complicated case. And you know, the nurse just was at her, her wit's end about right. what she was going to do with this individual client because the client, I think, had about 17 diagnoses on top of all the behavioral health issues. Um, and so we we really try to work with with people more on their time frame now. Yeah. And one last question. Do you find agencies now are finding a behavioral health nurse case manager? Uh, we are having trouble um, getting one. You yeah. know, and, and before we had one, so they right. were kind of like the glue to the program. And now there just aren't any of those nurses available. So it's, it's just, you know, harder. Well, one of the out. big, one of the big things, and I'd be happy to share it with the Alliance and even have Leslie send it out. If it was something you people are interested in, is that we recently worked with a very large health system down South and we had them send out a survey to all their employees um, about, you know, any kind of education they'd had in the past on behavioral health experience they had in the past. And many of them were not, that came back, were not psych nurses per se, mm -hmm. in the sense they're not maybe, you know, accredited or credentialed. Certified, yeah. But a lot of them have had some experience at one point or another um, that increased their comfort. Because we yeah. find comfort is really people think, oh, this is more challenging. You know, I, I think it's a, it, once they become more comfortable with it, but I will say another comment right now, they're, you know, hospital health systems are spending, and I can say this because I'm board certified, so I get the emails every day, so much money if you have a psych credentialing to come and work in their system. I mean, I had one contact me the other day, their rate started at $110 an hour, they were paying people. Yeah. So, you know, I, I see that that that's why I think there's more of a drain in certain places. Mm -hmm. but, um, we certainly could share this survey that Pete, you could use with your agencies that helps pull out elements of training people may have had over time. And mm -hmm. we encourage people to do that. Okay. And this agency in Florida, they didn't think they had a lot of people with psych experience. And it, it was what, 35%? 35% of the nurses okay. actually had had at least a year's experience with psych. Right. And they're, they had a lot of OTs that did too as well. So that was another, that it's right. some career. We found they were invaluable yeah. and to, then the, of course to social, the care team. Absolutely. Right. And then of course, social work does obviously. Right. Yeah. Right. 
So, well, thank you for your time. I need to sign off and I'm, I'm not trying to be rude. I just have to go to a quick funeral. So okay. bye everybody. Nice to see everybody and happy Good holidays. You, happy holidays. Bye Take care. Bye-bye. Um, Catherine, your Ernie has his hand up. Okay. Hi. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Um, it's a great presentation. A uh, couple of questions. Early on in the in your presentation, you mentioned uh, a survey of home health agencies where they were discussing, um, you know, how how many of them felt that they needed help in this area or or dealt with patients that had these conditions. Yeah. Just off the top of your head, do you recall how many agencies were represented by that particular survey? I don't. I'd have to go back and pull the data from what Leslie, son, Amy, and I. It wasn't a lot. It was. It was. I want. I mean, it was somewhere between was it five, eight? five or, and might have been ten or twelve. It was probably a yeah. third of our okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. One of the slides you put up a little bit uh, ago noted that there had uh, been a, a fairly significant increase in people reporting various mental health disorders since the pandemic. Right. And I'm just wondering, do you have a sense of whether that trend is going to continue or uh, is that something that's going to change as, as we, well, the pandemic isn't over, but people seem to think it is in some areas. Uh, <laughs> what do you think is going to happen in the next two or three years with that? Well, so this, it's interesting. I was, I just did a a podcast on this topic, to be honest with you, with a an a, a education company, and that was one of the questions that was asked: is are they are is this are these numbers going to stay high? And honestly, Ernie, the reason I think that they will is because there's there's more mental health, but there's less there's not in more providers. So we may have gone to a higher we have more people saying they have a mental health issue, but we have less providers. So what I see happening is and I still, Amy and I both see clients, is that right now more than half of my clients that I work with have pretty significant mental health issues. And one of the things that I see is that the access for them is so limited that that's why I, I think that the numbers are going to stay high for a while because there just isn't anywhere for them to get seen a lot of times. I mean, one day I spent, I called 22 psychiatric practices to get someone into it and not one of them was taking patients yeah you know and that's that's the issue i was finally able to get this woman only into a nurse practitioner after i begged someone and this woman it was it's extremely suicidal and it just you know their their response is we just don't have enough people so the other element I see is that a lot of our elderly and non-elderly as well are very, like you mentioned, the pandemic's not really over. There's some people who think it is, but people are very fearful. I mean, I had a woman tell me the other day, I'm, I'm not going to go out of my house. I'm not going to get sick. It just makes me too anxious to go out. So I think not only did the pandemic make it more evident that there's issues, but I think there's still a lot of people that are very fearful and depressed and anxious because they've been so lonely and isolated. Yeah. Well, we, I think I, I would, I would not be surprised if most agencies on this call would agree with this statement, but uh, we've definitely had patients refuse services because they were afraid to let people into their home or they would only let a limited number of staff in and we just could not provide the full menu of services they needed because right. they would not allow us access out of fear of getting COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, in New Hampshire, uh, unfortunately, some organ, some political groups seem to take that live free or die stuff way too seriously. <laughs> um, so, you know, we had a dearth of mental health beds in this state before the pandemic, and it's certainly been exacerbated by the pandemic. Right. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Thank you. I mean, it is. It's it's scary. I don't know what we're going to what's ultimately going to ha happen. And I know our current president just signed in a lot of legislation that I read to keep improving access to mental health, but the issue is having enough mental health, you know. Well, Catherine or Amy, do you do you still per, do you perceive that there is still this societal stigma that mental health represents some sort of character flaw that prevents people from accessing the help that they should be getting, uh, or even among policymakers, is, is there still that perception that is a roadblock to the, the policies we need to have to adequately treat this issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there, I think, you know, and I think our elderly, honestly, 
you know, I had a gentleman say to me one day, I am not depressed. I want you to know that. And I said, okay. He said, I just, I just, I'm so down, but that's the same thing. Like he just didn't get, you know, but whatever. So I, when I talk to him, I don't use the word depression. I used, you feel down because it's what he's comfortable with. And if the, it was the only way I could get him to seek treatment, I'll do it. But I do think there's still a lot of stigma. And I do think even though our primary care today has this big focus on mental health, a a very good friend of mine who's a primary care physician said, there's a focus, but I don't have the time to do that. He said, I get to spend seven to eight minutes with a patient. I barely can get through their medical problems before it, let alone get to mental health issues. Isn't it interesting how they, they seem to create this dichotomy between your medical problems and your mental health yeah. problems, like there's some difference. Right. Yeah, I agree. You know, and I think, of course, they should all be treated the same and one goes handedly with the other, but yeah. not everybody still yeah. sees it that way. Thank you very much, folks. Um, Leslie, I saw there were some questions in the chat, too, that... Yep, I, I, there's uh, two, um, two, I think. Yeah, so let's start with... Tammy, Tanny, um, can you tell us what the time frame from the seven webinars would take place? Like, are we doing one a month? Are we doing three in the spring or in the fall? What, what are we doing? That actually would be, we would obviously, um, Leslie, plan that out with you and Gina. Mm-hmm. But, and again, they would be recorded. So anybody, if you were an agency and you didn't have, say, couldn't send staff to train till the second training, everything would be obviously recorded. So probably what we would shoot to do is in every quarter, do it, do two webinars in, in every quarter. Okay. But again, it would be recorded and accessed so people could access them through the um, Alliance to, to make up for anything that they would miss. That's good. Um, and then Lisa, um, her question in the chat is, how much of the success with this program depends on the doctor's participation in the plan of care. Often PCPs are not responsive to mental health needs and it really limits our ability to manage the patients. Right, well, it's interesting because I, Amy and I um, have been actually, writ- we have part of our education and scripts we provide is how to talk to a patient about your client's results. When how to they- talk to the physician. Yeah, the physician, I'm sorry, when they have a positive you know, BIM score or or PHQ-9, and making sure that they understand it's now mandatory for agencies to do this, and it's going to be, you know, more incumbent on them to participate. What I find, this is just my experience with a lot of primary cares, is they might start someone off on a treatment, but then they really would like the person to see a mental health professional. That's great, in theory, was that won't always happen for you know, all people, especially elderly, and especially your ones that are homebound, um, that they're going to get out and see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Um, And so it is important, but I think one of the components in our sales and marketing is really also how, as an agency, you want to approach physicians to get them involved in this. And as they move into their reimbursement being tied to outcomes, you know, do you want to wait six months with someone's depressed so they're not going to take their blood pressure meds and their cardiac meds and going to end up back in the emergency room? Or are you more willing to do it? And I had a physician say to me the other day, you know, now that you put it that way, I probably should do something about this. I should probably bring this was a woman that's very depressed in at least to talk to her about it. And she did. Um, It does take a little coaching. It does take a different line of communication, but that's why we really want to make sure we help all the agencies from the sales side so that they they feel confident in communicating the message to physicians about why it's so important. Um, The next question in the chat, Catherine, I think um, is actually really to the point of how many people um, can access your materials once the agency has them, when the agency signs on. Okay, as far as your clinicians? Well, right, so can the webinars be viewed by multiple people in the office? The books, oh, yeah. they're in the office for reference, so they're available to anyone on staff. They can train okay. from those. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It's sort of a train the trainer model. You know, it's not, you know, like when we do, when we 
give you resources for your offices and your staff, you know, the, it, you can use, anybody can use them beyond just the 10 people that come to the train, the that training. you ultimately to the training. Yes, absolutely. All right. Any other questions for Amy and Catherine? It's been a few years since we, um, since we did do this, but I will send everyone on the call a link to Clear Path, the original ones. You can kind of get an idea of what the webinars look like all housed together, um, if, that, if that's helpful. And Emily. Oh, Leslie, op operationally, what kind of timeline are we looking at here to see if this is going to be a go or not? I think we've decided we will be offering it and then um, and it'll so January would be when we can start like taking sale, taking like registrants, right, Catherine? Yeah. And then we would get it up and running February, March, like within the like end of the first quarter. Yeah. Yeah. Our goal would be in the first quarter of 2023 to start getting some, you know, pick a date with the participants to get that initial training done. Um, and I, somebody asked if um, we can send a copy of the handouts and Leslie, I'll send you some when we get off the call so you can distribute it to everybody. Can I ask one more question? As far as this training, how many hours of it would be um, towards the dementia training? Well, there, the so the the full day training, if you think about it now, um, would be is a full eight hours, and you know if you categorically broke it out that eight hours, we'll be focusing on the three diagnoses now. Um, so probably, you know, at least two hours of that time, and then some of the webinars are there's half the webinars have dementia or related topics, so. Um, and if you chose that as an organization alliance that you wanted more webinars geared into the dementia topics, the ones that we propose also can be adjusted to what the members would, would choose. So we can also provide you a list of all the webinars we do have if people would rather choose the ones that we did, we're happy to do that as well. I'm just thinking we may be able to kill two birds with one stone since we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, since we have hundred yeah. percent, yeah, they qualify. You right. just awesome. need to, um, and Catherine and Amy can come up with a different one, but you just change your template of a certificate. This counts for your four hours of training. Good job. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh yeah, we okay. can certainly provide you a list of all the topics we have. The ones that we had on the slide are more common ones, but we can certainly always address them to your needs. Yeah. Oh, in the chat, I put the um, the link to the web page that hosts the clear path. I'm looking at it now. I don't think I have any passwords on it, but if <laughs> you come upon a page you can't see, let me know. I'll, I'll fix it. And I'll get the slides right out to Leslie right after this. And, and if anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to Amy or I, or talk to Leslie and, you know, we'll certainly disperse any information that anybody, you know, comes up with that they, you feel you need. Perfect. All right. All right. All right. We'll be in touch everybody and have a, have a safe and happy holiday season. We're closed like the 25th to the first. So um, it won't be that week. <laughs> we'll be in touch after that. Okay. Well, happy Thank holidays. You. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Okay. Bye bye.